Hey, welcome to Engineering Tomorrow. I'm your host, Brian Gomsky. This week we have a couple of great guests. Uh, Matt Pethley with Spirotherm, who is an expert in coalescing air separators and dirt separation for HVAC system loops. We also will have uh, Jeff Henderson, who is a 15-year seasoned sales engineer for commercial HVAC. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's dive right in. Broadcasting around the world. This is Engineering Tomorrow, the podcast committed to bringing you the best in commercial construction, design, and engineering from the brightest minds in the industry. This is the stuff they don't teach you in school. So sit back, relax, and open your mind. You're about to get the insider knowledge to improve your next construction project or advance your career. This is Engineering Tomorrow. We're we're here today to talk about, you know, Spirotherm. Um, You know, the big thing that that we've heard is it's kind of the new normal nowadays when it comes to air and dirt separation. Um, It seems like uh, a lot of the industry has, has come to terms and understands the importance of removing air and dirt from the system. So with that, I kind of shoot it over to you, Matt, and, and maybe we start off by, you know, talking a little bit about, you know, how does air and dirt affect your system? Air separators were invented because of no heat calls. And, uh, but now people are, you know, through, through better understanding, people are understand, um, they're relating the, my fluid to the blood. So, you know, I got this great slide that um, it's the lifeblood of the system. You can have the best chillers or the best condensing boilers and best pumps, everything, you know, even controls. But if your water quality is is not very good, then that system's never going to reach its its peak of efficiency. It's like having the, a hybrid car. Um, and you're having your tires partially inflated. I mean, what, yeah. what good is that? You know, <laughs> so the distribution efficiency is where the air separator, nobody thinks about it, but um, that's right. kind of where this is evolving to. Right. So, yeah. So what you're saying is you got dirty blood. doesn't matter how good everything else is, is, is working. What good is your body, right? If your blood quality is not good to deliver food and, and oxygen to it. Right, right. Okay. Well, um, kind of getting into uh, a little bit of the weeds of, you know, how specifically air and dirt affects your system. Um, do you want to talk a little bit, maybe we just start with air and, and the, the, what it does to a, 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 a hydronic system, a typical hydronic system? So some of the, the easiest ones, are when it, you know, it was invented for maintenance purposes for no heat calls. So we have air locks in the system no heating or sometimes no cooling that is from um, too much air being bound in the pipes and the fluid can't, Mm -hmm. can't push it through. So somebody has to mainly bleed it. And we see this all the time where this can be a process over weeks. They'll get some flow established, the more air will come back to that point. And uh, it's a never ending nightmare for some folks. So that's uh, again, that's, that's why they were first invented really was for, for air locks. Then we have noise. Uh, not uncommon to have a gurgly, pitchy noise. So I was at a hospital in Toledo once, and on their whiteboard, you know, they said they had, showed in there they had to move a patient because the air noise from the chilled water system was so, so annoying to that patient, um, which, you know, it's kind of extreme. I hear more of that in higher ed. We do a lot with the colleges and universities, and same thing in the classroom. It's disruptive, mm-hmm. whereas velocity noise, sometimes we get chilled water, is more constant, it's like a white noise or a fan noise. You will tune that out, but air noise quite often um, is is pitchy in in most cases annoying to people. And then of course, when we, further with noise, is we'll hear our pumps cavitating, so you'll hear that vibration. We've heard rocks; it sounds like they're they're churning rocks in there. Well, that's really yep. not the case. It's air bubbles expanding about a thousand times um, from the differential and pressure in there and of course that's very damaging to it but you can yeah really eat up an impeller really quick with cavitation right and it also um um pump seals as well so that's another factor air can actually shorten the life of so there's a number of reasons why we you know we care about air right Um, and then 
And then also something we've kind of discovered by mistake is, well, we didn't discover that air is an insulator, mm -hmm. but we've discovered that it has insulating qualities. So when we started getting feedback from our, our clients out there that my system isn't having to run as longer or I'm getting a, I'm getting better heat transfer. I'm getting more of a Delta T at this coil. And you know, that was like, what did you guys do? I'm like, I don't know. We just removed the air, <laughs> but uh, that's what it came to. It's, you know, I always point to um, double pane or triple pane windows. We have some kind of gas in there that's slowing that reaction that he, he transferred on and same things on our pipes, right? Mm -hmm. We, we insulate the exterior of the pipes, but nobody really thinks about these little bubbles that are circulating through the inside. Well, there's also insulators, but the system still works. So that's where the great mystery begins. It's like, well, I don't have any problem with air. And it's like, well, you can still have a lot of air and that system's going to work. It's just having to run longer. So we're wasting energy. We're inefficient mm -hmm. at that point. So the implications of having air in your system and not having it properly removed or, you know, you get sound complaints, you get pump cavitation, which could be damaging maintenance costs for more seals and pillars that need to be swapped out. Um, you get uh, inefficiency, like you just said, it's an insulator. So your chiller, your boilers are not as efficient because they're not exchanging heat at the same rate they would be if you had all water in the system. Right. So those types of things are dollar signs, you know, left and right and, and, that could be very expensive for an owner or installing contractor. Um, moving on to dirt. Obviously, I mean, you say I got dirt in my, in my water. You, you just know right off the bat that that's a bad thing. What are some problems that you've seen or run into with dirt and hydronic systems? Well, the, the question I always ask everybody is, uh, you know, my water looked clear or it should have been clear when I filled, filled up the system. So what happened? Where? you know where did this train run off the tracks and it's uh you know sometimes it's on a brand new lead certified building that had been flushed and had all the proper checks um it's been in buildings where it's been properly chemically treated uh, and so how does it occur um well it's it goes back to the air the air causes the oxidation anything that's uh iron or steel related it's gonna it's gonna rust right if i have enough air in that in that system and so that's where it's um damaging chemicals don't really get rid of the air they only mask it and at some point they're going to go down a drain so chemicals are good especially in the beginning mm -hmm. but they're really not going to help me with my heat transfer or, or, or those issues either so it's kind of you know part of the equation but that's in our industry that's been kind of the answer to that let's dump in a bunch of chemical inhibitors oxygen scavengers and let's add some side stream filtration to it um the side stream filtration is good. I mean, I I have a filter on my a whole house filter on my domestic side. You know, I, I believe in filtration, but the problem with filtration is it doesn't get rid of the root cause, which is the air. So yeah. it always goes back to the air, no matter what we're talking about. It's it's the devil. It's the root cause right. for, for a lot of problems in a hydronic system. Right. So you got to get both out of your system. Um, with dirt, I can't tell you how many times that we get phone calls and say, I've got really dirty water what are some ways to to get rid of that um and all of them except for you know installing and we'll get to this a little later and air dirt separate it requires adding energy um whether it's adding a pump for side stream or putting in a, a big basket strainer that requires maintenance energy you know maintenance man going out there to swap out uh so um implications of dirt are enormous you get clogged system same thing you dirt's an insulator it's going to stop heat transfer on your chillers and, and boilers and heat exchangers, and you're going to lose dollars and efficiency. So um, those are the implications of, of having air and dirt in your system. And, and you can kind of see why it's important to at least address each of those items um, if you are an engineer, owner, installing a contractor. Um, you want to make sure that you're addressing all those needs. So I guess we'll move in and move on to, uh, um, all right, we have to address problems with air and dirt as we're designing the system. How do we go about doing that? Um, so uh, maybe we talk about types of air separators, types of air and dirt separators. Um, I'll let you go into that a little bit. All right, so I'll, I'll start with just a really quick history lesson here. Okay. So this is an ad from the 1940s. This is the first known air separator that we're aware of that came out in the marketplace. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Um, so today we call these air scoops, but I still see them in, in spec language for commercial systems at times. Uh, but basically it's, we've got a large cast iron body in this case. And these are, I don't know what the proper weirs or wears. So basically we got these dams that are trying to um, create turbulence to mm -hmm. make bubbles go up to the top. So the, the large body is good and, and uh, an air separator is about slowing the velocity down, whether it's ours or anybody else's, even this technology, we're trying to slow basically a river down into a lake mm -hmm. and then back into a river again. The problem with these is that, um, they, they counter what we try to do, which we want no turbulence. We want it calm and there. So bubbles can rise freely where that was their initial design was trying divert them upwards. And the thing with these is my water has to be going super, super slow, like one, two GPM uh, for the bubbles to come up. Otherwise they get carried in the current, right. which is what we call in trained air. They just get skirted on out through it. So somebody would shut off their boiler or their pumps, excuse me. And then they would, they would, some of these air bubbles would migrate to the top and they'd hear it hissing out some air and they're like, Oh, this thing's working. But most of them were just passing on by. Right. So it did something, just didn't do a whole lot. And then we get to these. Now, um, the, they have a couple different names, tangential because the pipe connections are on the side or a tangent. Mm -hmm. They're called centrifugals because um, they use centrifugal force. Basically, we have water coming in through the top and it circles through the bottom and, ex or, and exits out the bottom. And uh, a lot of people don't, a lot of engineers in particular that lay these out do not know that they've been VE'd. So some things that had happened over the years is that they used to have a, a screen in them, basically like a strainer that would collect the bubbles and vent them out the atmosphere. Well, that's been VE'd by per everybody. That, <laughs> it, and I won't go into the details, but you know, they're just trying to cheapen it up. So is that what is, what is called a coalescing medium? That's what you see in there, is it, that something different? It kind of is because it was meant to to harness the bubbles, but it it's not it's not used in the same way where our, our media is actually in the flow fluid path trying to pull right. it out. This is just uh, what they're trying to do in here is create a little vortex or like a tornado. Right. This is supposed to be a, a lo lower pressure zone in the center of the tank. And so in theory, what was supposed to happen is bubbles would, because they're lighter, would be sent to that center vortex. And then that tube of perf steel would, would collect them and, and then it would vent out to the expansion tank. But um, Is that showing the water flow magically wisping around that center thing there? Or? Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> So uh, picture a toilet bowl, you know, but uh, <laughs> down south of the equator. So it's going counterclockwise. And uh, yeah, that, that's what happens to it. So it's been VE'd and it's not just um, with this brand, which B&G was the innovator of this back in the 50s. So 1957 is when these were patented. 1960s is when we really saw them come about. And, um, and we still see... The industry, our industry is changing. I, they're probably in maybe 50% of the specs now. So it is going coalescing, which we'll talk about more here in a, you know shortly. But there's still a lot of these out there. And the complaint is, I don't hear about problems. Or the response is, it's not a complaint. They just say, I don't hear about problems when I want to use these. Or even facilities directors will say, I have these in my buildings and it's heating and cooling just fine. I don't have a problem with air. And that's, that's when we got to go back to them and say, well... That's not a good barometer to say I don't have problems. Um, let's look. Let's talk about that a little bit more. And, right. Uh, strainers. You know, I don't see them a lot with strainers, but those have been. They're half the size that they used to be. I'm usually the one telling the maintenance people that they have a strainer in there, and they might want to check that. But most of them don't even know <laughs> yeah. it's there. There's a there'll be a cap on the drain line that's totally rusted, so I know they've never looked at it in the <laughs> 10, 15 years that they've had it. Um, but here's a picture I took at ASHRAE a few years back where, you know, in this case, it was B&G that was showing you that it's empty now. Uh, that's, that's where the design has gone. And then, um, and I'm not picking on B&G here. They're, they're the ones that invented it. They're the ones that actually give you a sizing chart. So this is a lot of training I do with people is, um, is showing them this because most people, the rule of thumb is to match it to the line size. If I got a four inch pipe, I'm gonna have a four inch flanged uh, tangential separator. And it's kind of because of 
of this chart where it says design capacity, GPM, this is what throws off a lot of designers because what do you think of when you hear design capacity? I, to me, that, that means max flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the, but that's not what they're saying in this chart. If you look at the, the graph on the bottom right here, they're telling you that if you actually want it to be efficient at removing 97.5% of the air, that you can only run about, let's just round that up to 27%. These are the ones with the strainer. You, you have to use a multiplier, basically, 27% times these flows. And then I have it cut off here. I think it's 18% for the, the ones without the strainer. So what are they telling you here? They're, even though my design capacity on an eight inch with the strainer says 1300, or excuse me, 1800, or it is 1300, can't see very good here. Um, they're telling you by their own math that it's really only efficient up to 350 GPM. So what does that mean? That means that I may have eight inch pipe, but to slow that fluid down enough, in there, I probably, you know, if it's a heating loop, I may need a 10 or a 12 inch. Yeah. And if it's chill wire, I may need up to 20 inch. And that's, that's not going to be done in the field. So, so what's happening is you're seeing engineers design their air separator for the same size as their header, installing it. And in what's happening in reality is that air is flying right by. It's not getting separated <laughs> at all Correct. because we're not going down to where, uh, the, the unit actually operates correctly. Right. So the, the flaw with this design is that it, it, um, it relies on centrifugal force and there's really one sweet spot where that is too fast or too slow. It doesn't work very good. So you have to remember these came out, you know, fifties and sixties, we didn't have VFDs on our pumps. So mm -hmm. when we had a constant speed pump, um, they were probably sized more, more appropriately, but now when we have a VFD on almost every pump, now I've got a problem, especially in these shoulder months, like now my, my velocity is really slow right. on a day like today. I'm not doing a lot of heating right now. So I really, I really do have a toilet bowl going in there and right. I'm, not, I'm not breaking apart bubbles either. Yep. So that that's the benefit of the coalescing separators. They don't, they don't care what tooth, right. we size them. What, what's my max flow going to be, but, and the slower, the better, the faster they perform. <laughs> Right. So to size this correctly, let's just say your header's, you know, four inch. Uh, for this chart, it might say that you actually need a six or an eight inch separator for the flow that you have. Then is the recommendation normally to increase up for the, for the air separator, then decrease back down afterwards, downstream? That's the correct way to install these? That is that is the proper way. Right. So, so you start looking at cost comparisons of a tangential properly sized versus uh you know a you know properly designed coalescing medium type air separator you start to see that there's more than just the the price to price comparison of the units right okay and even still even if they are properly sized these still can't get 100 percent of the air out and that's really the you know if there's right. any one takeaway even if they had that piece back in on the, the perforated yep. steel, even if we have them at the right speed, which by the way, Amtrol makes one of these and they say the right speed is, is six feet per second. Yeah. So just kind of middle of the road to properly get the air removal out of it. Right. But even, if, you know, even if we're hitting that sweet spot, they still cannot get a hundred percent air out. They cannot stop corrosion from happening. And that's, that's where, you know, the benefit of our technology so now it's 2022 <clears throat> and um we're here with spirotherm so um you know let's talk about the spirotherm air separator um what is different about that the spirotherm air separator versus what you just showed us uh the the main thing is well first of all we don't have the pipes centered so um or we do have the pipe center, excuse me. We don't have them offset. We're not mm -hmm. creating centrifugal motion. We're we're just creating a smooth body in right. there, a calmness. It's like this place of zen for little bubbles to <laughs> uh, <laughs> migrate to. But we we have all this copper wire uh, it, it media. This copper pipe is the core, and we have two copper wires soldered around in this engineered pattern, and it attracts air bubbles to it. So think of a straw in a can of pop or soda, depending on what you call it. Um, the, the surface tension draw, you know, we're getting, we're talking molecular. We're really geeking out here at the moment, <laughs> but 
that's you know that's what's drawing the air bubbles and attracting it yeah got it all right um matt uh, we've talked about uh, the types of air separators now um let's add in the the uh the dirt separation feature what is the difference between you know a spirotherm uh air separator or for that matter any brand of air separator uh and an air and dirt separator Sure. So like the old style, you know, we remove air and we could have the option for the strainer, which would get some particulate or objects. Uh, what you see here, the one on the left is an air only model. So the, the pipe connections are more towards the bottom. It's not really going to pick up any kind of dirt or uh, filter anything the way the media has been designed. It's just going to pass on through it, but it's just going to attract air bubbles and, and vent them out. The one in the middle is one that just removes dirt or particulate. And as you can see, the pipe connections are pretty close to the top. So it's not going to be removing air, uh, just just like a similar to a dirt leg on the gas line. It's going to be collecting debris. And we predominantly use this model for condensing systems, cooling towers, full flow. That's its primary purpose, although we sometimes use it in closed loop two, where we can't get the one on the right to fit, which is the combination air and dirt. This is what you absolutely must have on a retrofit, or we recommend anyway to protect your investment, whether it's old or new. And even on new construction, we see this model being selected. Um, you know, the, the pipes may come in rusty, but theoretically the separator is gonna remove so much air from day one, we're really not gonna have much corrosion in there. But the thought is, why wouldn't I want that protection right, right from the beginning? So in retrofit applications, um, you're coming into an old system that might have one of those old school tangential style air separators on them. Well, over the years, you get, you know, pipe rust and everything else in your system and that water over time gets dirtier and dirtier. So if you're coming in to do something else with your system, maybe you're changing out a chiller, maybe you're doing some kind of performance contracting. And and while you're doing that, those kinds of change outs, that's a good time to look at putting in an air and dirt separator in place of where that tangential old school style air separator is right now and that buys you the increased efficiency of the air separation and then adds into um adds into the package the dirt separation aspect which will help clean up your water so when you say real retrofits you guys you know recommend them on all of them that's kind of why you're, you're doing that and then separately it may just be Hey, I have a dirty system. My system's, you know, 20 years old and they got a tangential on it. What do we recommend to clean up? And, you know, service contractors ask us that all day long. And this is a great solution. Um, so moving on, uh, let's go ahead and jump into our little uh, demo here. Um, science project. Uh, this is uh, kind of a small demonstration of a hydronic system. Um, I'll kind of just let you take over and, and run the demo and show everybody uh, how, uh, how the technology works. Sure. All right, so I'm gonna turn it on. So this is a classic um, hydronics loop. Right now we have it running in a bypass, but basically we've got our combination air and dirt separator and normally they have an automatic air vent, which we still have the, the, the internal floats the sight glass so you can visually see the bubbles coming up all right so we've got our hydronic loop it's actually running right now it's quiet it's clear it's very much air free it might have just a little bit in there but this is how we want our system to run this is actually operating efficiently can can you just for people who are only listening explain what the pieces are in this little demo Sure. So we, we've got an air and dirt separator. We've got a sight glass um, for those that can see. And you might be actually able to hear the bubbles coming out too. Otherwise, you'd hear a hiss in the field of just air, like a little air compressor. We've got another little tank, which is our makeup water. And it also serves as our expansion tank. And we have a small inline circulator, um, just a fractional horse pump. And then we've got a hand pump, basically a bicycle pump that we're gonna inject air into this. So why do we have the pump? Because it's not like we go to buildings and we shoot in the air with a bicycle pump. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's 
it's we're maybe selling. you do that's how you're selling uh, that's how, that's, separators <laughs> the secrets that's out. Like, uh, been busted. so we're you know for anybody that's really wants to geek out in physics we're uh showing here henry's law henry's law tells us two things solubility of water and it basically means air is going to come out and be a bubble and a problem that we deal with uh, when two things happen when we heat up water so picture a pot of boiling water i'm sure somebody's at least witnessed that being done before it actually boils the little bubbles that attach to the the, the bottom and the sides of the pan that it's dissolved air mm -hmm. coming out from a rise in temperature henry's law also tells us that a drop in pressure is going to make us um have air bubbles come out of solution too. So basically the water is becoming super saturated as it raises in temperature and the pressure drops. So that's why we typically put the air separator right after the boiler, hottest water and on the suction side of the pumps because I have the most air being cooked out, you know, for lack of a better term, um, my water is most saturated there. Or on chilled water, we're gonna put it, the separator on the return line, which is my warmest water suction side of the pumps because you, you will exploit it the most there or optimize is the better word. We have the most air bubbles in that location. So, so before you do that, what we're seeing right now, um, to me, it doesn't even look like the water is moving. I hear a little, a slight hum from a pump, but it looks like it's still. So that's really the optimal solution. Like this is the, this is what it looks like when it's working. This right? is the goal. This is the goal. So what are you about to do now? So I'm going to inject some air, just a couple of shots. All right, now we're seeing tons of bubbles. It's loud. Um, tons of air moving through. Yep, Jeff's moving the mic over. You can probably should be able to hear it now. So there's a couple things going on with this system now. This is, uh, unfortunately, this is how most of the systems run that don't have a coalescing separator. It is working right now. It's still circulating that fluid. It's still transferring heat. But uh, you hear the hum of... of of the motor you hear the cavitation this pump right now is doing dual duty it's compressing air bubbles as it's trying to circulate the fluid which is a lot of resistance on it, it does anybody drive their car with with foot on the gas and slightly touching the the brake pedal at the same time <laughs> right but you know that's only when i'm drifting <laughs> <laughs> that that's essentially what we're doing with this pump right now we're we're making it work a lot harder it, it sounds like a hot tub basically so we have that going on. So that that's a problem for pumps uh, that wear out prematurely. We talked about seals, but you know, there's the bearings and the impellers uh, as well. And then when we look at my heat transfer, um, anywhere in these pipes right now, it's terrible. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we we insulate the inside, but nobody are the outside of the pipes, but nobody thinks about the inside. Um, and then there's noise. So I had this even the boiler in my house. I had a noisy conditions and it was air related. Um, so there's, you know, three main drivers of air. And then of course we get to the, we'll get to the dirty, we'll get to the dirt later. Mm -hmm. um, so basically I'm gonna run it through this environment now that's been running in bypass. Okay. And again, we're talking about a river going into a lake and then back into a river again. So you're gonna hear it quiet down you might see these bubbles actually pick up speed here momentarily because once we get that resistance on the impellers, my pump can actually move more freely again. It's because of that. If a pump's on a VFT, that's one of the ways we can actually slow it down because it can still deliver the same amount of BTUs without with, with using less power than before. So within maybe three seconds, I would say the sound cut in half. And now we're maybe at 30 seconds. It's almost all the bubbles and sound is almost gone at this point. So basically what's happening here, we've got this copper mesh, all this wire in there. That's our coalescing media. Co the term coalescing just basically means bubbles are going to group together. They're going to form in there and they're going to attach and all that surface area because of the surface tension. Okay. And so what happens is um, large bubbles don't even attach. So I'll just show or enter another, uh, another slug of air. Mm -hmm. The bigger bubbles, somewhere in here. Big bubbles don't even attach. They don't coalesce because it's so calm and non-turbulent in there, which is that's the whole principle behind it. Make it calm and smooth, and then the bubbles will either rise 
and the smaller ones, the micro bubbles, as people like to call them, will, will coalesce. But eventually, when enough of those collide into each other, they will rise up to the top. But it's so common there. I, our uh, East Coast Regional took a video, a slow motion one, and we actually saw bubbles going back, coming back towards the flow path mm. to attach, and then they rose up. So it was, it was some pretty cool, you know, if you really study it for a while, I mean, it is really super common there. We, we think that it's just gonna uh, stay in train, and, but the media really is the special sauce behind the design, and that's why we're so effective. That's why we have a lot of people asking for more of our units. It's not because uh, we take people on trips to Hawaii, although yeah. I which which we do. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I really want to go there. So right now I'm changing things up. I'm injecting some dirt. This is simulated dirt. This is zeolite from a water softener. It's really good imitation rust. I'd say it's about 90 microns. And we still had some air that was trapped in that that bypass line. In fact, I'll just pump in some more because if you have dirty water in your system, you've got air problems too. So okay, so now the entire loop's brown. It's simulating the dirt with air. And we like to call this liquid sandpaper. So think about every time we have a bend in the piping, um, control valves, especially pressure independent control valves are not very tolerant of, of dirt. Uh, condensing boilers, don't necessarily like them as much as um, non-condensing, but um, there's a lot of problems. You know, nothing should have dirt in it. I mean, it, whatever whatever it is, standard efficiency, high efficiency, you're gonna you're gonna lessen its value when you have murky water running through it. Try some. Let me try some here real quick. Does that show it any better? Nah, you're fine. Edit that out. It's my flashlight. There you go. That doesn't help either. That's good enough. You can see it over here. Okay. So Brian, Brian will edit that out. Okay. All right. So we got uh, liquid sandpaper. So very damaging on, on the system from a maintenance or an owner's perspective. But then when we start talking energy, more people are familiar with fouling factors, especially when it comes to chillers because they're so energy intensive. Um, so that's another reason why I want to get rid of, if any dirt, the way it fouls up any heat exchange or any coil, you know, again, it goes back to, yeah, my system's going to work or it is working, but it's running longer as a result. So now we'll run it through the air and dirt separator and we're going to see tiny air bubbles that are arising through the top and the small dirt particles are dropping. Now we are filtering the water, but this shouldn't be confused with the filter. The separator needs multiple circulations. A filter is going to get whatever it's rated for one pass. But the problem with the filter or even the strainer is that once they accumulate debris, my pressure drop starts going up. Whereas with this technology, it doesn't. So my, my uh, tank or my vessel can only fill up to about the bottom of the pipes. And because we have an engineered product to not clog, it's going to just stop collecting the more dirt. It will pass, the crud will continue to pass through there. It will still remove air too. It just won't remove any more dirt until somebody comes by and opens up the ball valve that it comes with and flushes it can, out. Can this be, do people put a, like a timed, can, timed ball valve on there uh, for maintenance free or? Yeah, and it, that's growing. So we have some people that do that. Um, especially with glycol or if they use a lot of chemicals, they'll actually have a timer into a bag filter back into the system or some will just, uh, if we have regular water, we'll have a time. So it kind of takes the human factor out mm -hmm. of it and they can just have more control about when it's purged. But the maintenance is really on the front end. Most systems up to 12 inch, we can get them cleaned in one or two weeks if, if there's somebody there to, to purge these things. And then after that, they only need to be checked once or twice a year. it's uh, There's very little maintenance involved with them. How hard is it to open up a ball valve for three to five seconds? You can be holding your coffee in one hand and- Do the, uh, and do does the media ever get like a calcium buildup or anything or like, how, how does that work on the inside? Yeah, so it's it's copper and solder mm -hmm. and 
copper will form a, a tarnish or a patina, whatever you want to call it, uh, over time. And that, that actually acts as a protective layer. Okay. It's a pretty durable material as it is, but the, um, the, uh, the tarnish on it actually extends the life okay. of it, I'm told. Perfect. But the media doesn't typically need to be replaced as long as somebody's maintaining it uh, once in a while. Your spiral can last, even though they have a three-year warranty, you can get 20-plus years out of them. We do have some customers out there that still have them that old. So what happens if, you know, the installer, uh, a, a pipe fitter, leaves a, uh, you know, plastic bag or something in their loop and eventually mm -hmm. it makes its way to this, you know, dirt separator? Um, what happens at that point where do you need to disconnect the whole air and dirt separator and take it out of the system or how do you how do you recommend that that be, you know be able to be made maintained okay so we have a unit that has a bottom flange on it where if that happened somebody could remove it slide out the, the internal media and and pull out that bag or or get that or you could replace the media all together if right. you want to do that um I think maybe uh, another option would be to put in like a clean out hatch. That's uh, right. We did that at, at the Nike facility, right? Uh, there wasn't enough room. You have to have room to, to slide out the, the media right, at right. the bottom. So what's an you know, turn it up to that. We put the T with the blind flange on the inlet. and that, uh, Upstream of the. And that gives them access to reach in and pull out that Gatorade bottle and all the other, <laughs> the rags and the funny things. We right. About. Right. Oops. Okay. Before we uh, before we close out, um, um, I know that there's some new technology that's out, and you know it's not too often in the world of air dirt separation that you get new technology, but it might be a, a, a good opportunity to show. Um, Do we want to swap this out and put the yeah. other just demo on the table there? Yeah. Yeah. What What do we got here? Wow, look at this. So I'm guessing those legs are for demo purposes, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what are we looking at, Matt? All right, so yeah, we, we don't have new technology very often. When we do, we really have a party because it's <laughs> hard, hard to come up with something new with air and dirt technology. Uh, we did not come up with magnets. They've actually been used for a long time. In fact, our oldest case study has a hospital that used magnets to try and clean up the ferrous material iron oxides in that chilled water system. This is going back to 2001 and um, it didn't work very well. That's for the reason why we had the spiral event. They added the spiral event to fix that. But um, there's been a lot of marketing and, and publications about the use for a magnet and there is some good for them. Um, anything that's, that's ferrous or magnetic, it's going to help pick that up. Now the location of the magnet is pretty important. So this is just a demonstration piece, but my pipe connections would be about here. Okay. So the magnets in the... So that would be about halfway, right? Yeah. Yep. It, it's in the flow path. And basically, we have a spring at the top, and my magnet's up in here, and so my fluid's going by. It's it's collecting it. Now, we have all this media in here, so we're still removing dirt and having it settle down besides the magnet. But, you know, per pass, which we really don't make a per pass claim, but that's... But in common sense, you know, each pass of fluid that goes through this, is, it's going to be picking up more of that material. And then so what happens is when it accumulates enough or when it's time to maintain it, we pull down the handle and then my magnet, let's see if I can get this to stick. So it'll just slide down, my cred will slide down and then the little cone here, mm -hmm. you just saw, it flakes flakes off that debris in the bottom of my, my tank. Okay. And then so somebody comes by at that point and they open up the ball valve and that's how it's flushed out. Now, the, what's different about these is um, we would like our the pumps to not be running in this case. So normally with a regular spiral vent, we don't care. We do it all the time. Okay. We open up that ball valve, it's flushing up and you can still do that. But when it's time to clean the magnet, we want the pumps off because what can happen is as we're trying to slide it down that even though it's pretty calm in there, we can still get some interference of that fluid. Yep. So and send it back down the line. Right. So that's what, um, that's what we're trying to prevent from happening. So shut the pump off for 30 seconds, pull the magnet, turn it back on. Right. I mean, if somebody does it, is it still going to 
can we still expect some crud to go down with it? Of course. But, yeah, all the know. all the normal dirt separation that you're doing that's already at the bottom will be just fine. Right. And 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 blow down. So this is the new thing. This, it's it's not a gimmick. Uh, it's just sometimes we see in a chilled water sample, especially, um, it's not all ferrous material. We'll find calcium deposits in there, and um, you know, as I said to other people in, in our spiral blowdowns, we've seen copper shavings, we've seen plastic pieces, and I was even, I'm not joking when we say we found little pebbles and rocks on more than one occasion mm -hmm. too. And, Man. and my question is, you know, what what magnet do I use for a rock? Well, I, <laughs> I haven't found one yet. But uh, so the, they are good, but I think there's been a lot of fearing up in the industry that if we have a pump with the um, ECM motor, it's going to magnetize the shaft. And that's kind of where they're driving the engineer or the owner, like they're scaring them up. But that's only on liquid cooled uh, circulators and not everybody has that problem. Right. And uh, there's only one boiler manufacturer that will suggest it on a retrofit. So I'm not even saying on new construction, but if you have a spiral vent, you know, a regular spiral vent, we're already protecting that system and we don't discriminate. We're getting copper, ferrous, non-ferrous, rocks, right. um, plastic. <laughs> everything you know, anything that sinks we're gonna get get out but anyway that's new if somebody you know if we're too late to reach them on the magnet they like that then great you know here's your answer now one thing i'll point out is we don't use these on high velocity systems so like chilled water typically um because the magnets not and that's a really powerful magnet i almost got my hand crushed um wow. hold, holding one next to one of our steel vessels i mean yeah but it doesn't it doesn't matter if the my if I got fluid screaming through there. It'll it, it, it'll they become weak. At, you know. Yep. Are less efficient. No, not weak, but they're less efficient. So that's why we only put them on standard velocity uh, air and dirt separators or our quad hydraulic separators. Yep. As well. Okay. So new product. New product. Yeah. This is available today. It is available today. We do have them. Um, hard to keep things in stock right now, but of course there might be a, a few in stock. And um, yep. Or so to close it out, um, can you name drop maybe a couple of facilities you guys? Obviously, you've been around for a long time, but some notable facilities you guys are running in. Probably, you know, here here locally in our region. I know Boeing has quite a few. Um, University of Missouri. Mizzou has the world record for the largest. On the chilled um, water system, the campus loop was that thirty inch. It's thirty six inch. Thirty six um, inch runs thirty thousand five hundred GPM a minute. So that's our GPM. So that's uh, basically a swimming pool in a minute <laughs> going through theirs. Uh, but world records aren't you know the bragging rights. It's they had a bunch of other units, smaller units that fixed the problems, and that's what led to that. And they saw the efficiency gains. We'll have new stuff. Uh, I might have a new case study this summer about. Um, the kill kw per ton going down yeah on a on a chilled water plant so okay that, this is you know besides new product we've got some new new energy um case studies that we're looking at i'm pretty it's pretty exciting i mean it's you know air and dirt separation is not a sexy topic but uh, <laughs> how dare you yeah i know i know how shame on me for saying that how so, dare you i disagree to me it's like you buy a shoe, you, you buy shoes, you get shoelaces, you get a chiller, you buy an air and dirt separator, preferably a spirotherm. But it's like you would never not want this, right? I think that, you know, there's things that are you must have. And if I'm building up a, a hydronic system or a plant, I want air. I want to get the air out of the system and I want to get the dirt out of the system, you know, and it's with the overall cost and the, you know, relative to it's, how much the it's, chiller it's is nothing the compared cost, to the chiller to be able to keep your your water clean and air free um is pennies uh on the dollar compared to the rest of your plant mm -hmm. and then it's also a reputation right why would you want to design a system and then ha not have it meet its right you know, you're selling the owner i'm gonna, you know you're gonna save this amount of energy but <laughs> day one it's got a uh an energy penalty Right. <laughs> have an air in it's it a, or, I mean, it's a dirt. headache for the contractor and engineer down the road to their whatever, is, you know, let's let's say there is dirt and air. It's like you're losing that efficiency. They're screaming at the engineer and the contractor at least, you know, 
put it in there, offer it, make them pull it out. But right. again, if you're an end user, it's a no-brainer. Yep. I would agree with that. Pretty rare. That, you know, I find somebody that does, says they don't want an air separator. It's just, you know, making it fit. We're, we were too late to get right. the facility or, um, you know, the budget is always the underlying issue. Yep. Awesome. Well, Matt and Jeff, thank you for being on, both of you. Um, you're Jeff, hope, uh, Matt, I know you're out from in from out of town, but Jeff, you're local, and I know where to find you. So hopefully you can be on the show a little more often. I will, I will try and, to make uh, myself available. Share uh, some of your expertise with the nation. To, to join you more often, Brian, I promise. All right. Um, so again, thank you all for listening. Um, if you're listening in the car or just via the podcast, please look for Engineering Tomorrow on YouTube to find our videos. Um, again, you can see all those demos on the actual video feed and like, and subscribe on all your favorite platforms, um, helps keep the show going, helps keep our ad revenue running. Um, again, thanks again and keep engineering for tomorrow today. Thanks for joining us on engineering tomorrow. If you liked the show, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. For even more great engineering or construction knowledge, visit engineeringtomorrow.blog.